Thanks for having me along to the group. Um, it's been uh, a very busy few weeks and months, not only with this work, but also uh, I'm based here in the UK and it's, uh, it's just been chaotic in general with changes of government and government budgets and all sorts of things. Um, but I'm going to quickly run through with these slides um, some of the background to the study that we recently published on a frequent flyer levy, um, some of the kind of modeling considerations, some of the impacts it could have, some legal considerations. Um, and it's a kind of mishmash of um, content that's been brought together across the three reports that you can see uh, on the cover here. So uh, one on the left is by CE Delft, a consultancy in the Netherlands who did some of the technical modeling on this using the European Union's um, air passenger forecast model. On the right, the legal assessment that we commissioned from Adderstone Law, a specialist aviation um, uh, legal practice. Um, and then in the middle, the kind of um, civil society report that brings together all of the analysis and the one that was published um, and launched in the media uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I know there's an awful lot of expertise in the room. Um, I'll, I'll, I've left room plenty of time for discussion and questions at the end, but if there's anything pressing, feel free to uh, cut me off and, and, and ask if I've explained something poorly. Um, so just in terms of the structure, I'll briefly go through the kind of project context and the political context, and then I'll talk mostly about the economic modeling and the legal fe feasibility of the proposed um, levy, and then we'll move to questions and discussion. Um, just in case you're not aware, so the New Economics Foundation that I work for, in case um, what who we are. So um, NEF is a charitable think tank. Um, think tanks are research institutes. If you're, um, I think if you're coming from another part of Europe, they might be framed differently. But um, we don't have any party political affiliations, and you can see how we're funded on our website. We're transparent about who funds us because there are some think tanks in the UK that are a bit dodgy on that sort of thing. So it's always worth checking. Um, at NEF, New Economics Foundation, we uh, first started uh, researching and talking about the idea of a frequent flyer levy about 10 years ago with our first report with a campaigning charity called Possible. Um, and we've continued working on it since then and had some modest success with it from the perspective that at various points, UK political parties have adopted the frequent flyer levy um, in their manifestos prior to elections but they've never, uh, it's never been adopted by the winning party. So hence we don't have one in the UK right now. So still plenty of work to be done there. But more broadly, NEF works on all sorts of different aspects of the kind of economics of the green transition, social justice, and, and those types of issues, both in the UK and in Europe. Um, and this report was actually focused more at um, raising the profile and um, of the idea of a frequent flyer levy right across Europe um, and the media coverage that we had uh, a couple of weeks ago reflected that with um, ma you know, major outlets all across Western Europe picking up the analysis. Um, we were partnered in this project by Stay Grounded. If you're not familiar with them, they're a, a network of um, uh, various different groups, campaign groups, community groups, um, experts and others all working um, on the issue of aviation's climate impact. Um, and they were uh, key to bringing together the kind of coalition of organizations that had an input into um, the project and the design of what we were proposing. Um, so just a bit of context, although I imagine this will be fairly familiar for most of you. Why are we talking about the frequent flyer levy? Well, three main reasons. One is we want to cut emissions from aviation in the short to medium term. Um, second is that we do think that there's a credible case that there um, are some flights that are either essential or necessary for whatever reason that might be, whether it be for an emergency a humanitarian worker getting around the world to provide assistance, um, but also other, other classes of flights, you know, migrant workers who need to visit friends and family. Um, and, you know, there is an argument that within the remaining carbon budget, in my view, there is obviously space for infrequent um, flights by, um, by everyone, um, as long as those are done in a, in a manner kind of aligned with um, a climate compatible pathway for the sector. Um, if we don't, if we don't, uh, if we're not careful about how we approach it, of course, um, and our, our solutions for the climate crisis essentially mean increasing the cost of flying, which most other policies would do, 
um, whether that be a carbon tax, whether that be uh, caps on airport capacity, whether that be um, regulations insisting that airlines uh, change the fuels that they use to power their aircraft. All of these drives, drive the cost up of flying. And of course, the primary impact of doing that is to prevent lower income people from accessing air travel while wealthier groups can continue to fly. So the frequent flyer levy obviously targets that particular issue. Um, and then, of course, finally, the issue of raising funds um, to accelerate the transition to a fairer and greener economy across Europe. And also, um, as is being discussed right now in uh, at the UN climate conference, the issue of the support that's going to be provided to um, those nations that were less responsible for the climate crisis, but are nonetheless facing some of the most severe damages as a result of it. Um, so in terms of aviation and it's the sort of climate context, again, many of you probably discussed this, maybe even know more about this than I do, but my, my, my simple reading of the situation is that um, aviation emissions are rising and in, across Europe, they're forecast to continue to rise, particularly as slightly less um, developed nations sort of catch up and build out their air capacity. And in that context, the technological solutions that we currently have in front of us, particularly in the short to medium term, are not enough. And um, a responsible government would not rely on these technologies that don't exist at scale um, to manage an issue which does threaten all of our uh, safety and well-being. And as a result, the, the vast majority of experts, whether that be the International Energy Agency, the Royal Society, academics, other professionals recognize that there is going to be some role for, as they say, demand management or, you know, simply the idea of controlling the number of passengers and planes that um, that fly, particularly controlling growth, maybe even reducing um, the number of planes in the air, at least until the climate issue is resolved. Um, if we delay doing that, there are significant costs to all of us. That includes um, the aviation sector itself, um, you know, whether that be sim simply because of the um, political pressure that builds on the sector, uh, whether that be because of the climate damages that are done in the short, medium term, um, which we which accrue and build up and have longer term impacts for all of us, or whether that be the pressure that aviation, over, if overspending, if you like, the carbon budget or the remaining carbon emissions, um, put that puts pressure on other sectors and other communities that as a result would have to, if we're serious about meeting our temperature reduction goals, they would have to speed up their, their decarbonisation efforts, potentially at greater cost. And then, of course, there are the fairness aspects to this. So in general, though of course not, ex not exclusively, air traffic and passengers in, in the air are mostly on non-essential trips. Um, yeah, we've got da good data on this from the UK, which suggests that the, the large majority of passengers in the air or departing from UK airports are on leisure trips, outbound to leisure destinations, many of whom are doing that multiple times a year. I don't think that, while valuable to those individuals, I don't think that those can be considered essentials on the same level as other areas of the economy that also face a climate problem, such as agriculture, food production, and other forms of transport. Um, and then there's the issue about yeah, fairness on the sort of global and, um, you know, the inter international level. So if you were to chop up aviation's carbon budget and share it around every individual on the planet right now, you'd actually only have four short haul flights per person uh, left for the next 26 years. Uh, that sounds shocking, obviously, because I'm sure most of us have flown significantly more than that. Um, and that's, of course, because the vast majority of the world's population don't fly and aren't accessing any of their fair share of the aviation carbon budget. Um, if you were to accept the kind of distribution that we have now, which obviously sees the US and Western Europe consuming most of the carbon aviation's carbon budget, you would still you still have an issue in terms of how many flights you can take with the remaining carbon we can emit um, to meet our, our overall climate goals. Um, but I'll come back to that in a minute. It's just, again, kind of highlighting the, the fairness point. So, you know, Recent papers have shown that only 1% of the world's population actually cause around 50% of aviation's emissions, while 80% of the world's population never set foot on an airplane. And um, of course, there's there's the even more egregious emissions that come from private jets that I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with. Within Western Europe, which is our focus for this, um, this research, around half the population don't take a flight in any given year. Um, whereas 
around 10% of the population, 11% take three or more flights per year. So there is, even within Europe, significant uh, inequality in use of air travel. Um, and flipping that on its head and looking at it from an income point of view, amongst the poorest households, seven out of 10 don't fly in a given year, 70%, compared with the richest households where um, just 20% are not flying in a given year, so 80% are flying. Um, and that, of course, means that the wealthiest households are much more likely to be those frequent flyers. They're seven times more likely to be a frequent flyer than the poorest are. Um, the political context, an interesting one, has been a strange time in Europe, lots going on. Um, I'm sure many of you will have read about in different contexts the sort of idea of a green backlash, the idea that the European Union sort of and, and nations within Europe have been pushing green policies. And that some of, in some cases they've sort of been pu punished in the um, in the voter booths for um, getting those policies wrong or at least being perceived to. Now, the exact extent of how true that is, I think that it's subject is a debate which is subject to a lot of manipulation and you know the famous sort of farmers' protests. There was a lot of misdirection and um, things going on in lots of local contexts. Where, you know, there was, for example, in the Netherlands, you know, the, the issue was being weaponized slightly. But nonetheless, I think it's fair to say that there is some discomfort amongst a significant chunk of the population about whether or not the green transition is being done fairly, whether the European Green Deal, which promised to leave no one behind, uh, really is actually doing that, and whether it's addressing the fundamental inequities. Um, there's an argument that sort of, in an ideal world, the way that you could deal with all this stuff is you simply just put a price on, um, you know, environmentally damaging behaviors but in a world where we have extreme wealth and we have extreme poverty the impact of putting a price and uh, on environmental damages without considering the sort of social impact is can be negative and the the eu is currently uh, very close or proposing to put a carbon tax on for example domestic gas use for heating homes and that's going to be a really tricky and dangerous policy to implement because it may well be seen as a policy that penalizes lower income households and that's why we want policies in aviation to be as fair as possible and not just technically fair in on paper or in, in the spreadsheets, but actually visibly fair so that people, there could be no arguments as to exactly who is being targeted by the policy and why. So what is it exactly that we're proposing? This is um, the detail in the research. Um, I would say at this point that this is just one proposal for what the levy could could look like even within the group the coalition that developed this um this research and this paper we had disagreements about exactly what was the fairest design for the levy and there's elements of it the elements of what we fell upon that i even i'm not completely happy with but i think ultimately at, the, at this at this stage we're we're in primarily territory of popularizing the problem uh, highlighting the, the issues highlighting why this type of policy might be needed and what this example of the policy might be able to do, but that doesn't mean it's the end of the conversation. Um, we're interested to hear people's feedback on how it might be improved or elements that we might have missed. The first thing we had to do was to establish, well, what is the kind of target range of emissions reduction that we want to see from aviation? Um, and the reality is in the, the analysis that CE Delft did on this, the, the technical consultants, was that there's a huge range and it all depends on sort of, sort of what are more sort of moral choices than they are technical decisions as to what percentage reduction you fall upon in the short term. So, you know, if you, as I said earlier, if you focus on complete equality between all global citizens, then aviation's carbon uh, budget needs to reduce very significantly, potentially by up to 80%, because it just isn't used by the the, the lowest income people in, on, in, on planet Earth. So, we're sort of using an unfair share of our own of, of the remaining budget. If you kind of accept the distribution of aviation as it currently is, um, then you can say, well, maybe the reduction needs to be sort of less over the next over the next sort of few years. Um, but still, it's it's steep. You know, we we sort of arrived at an estimate that sort of responsible level of reduction would, could be in the range of forty five percent over the next few over the next sort of five to ten years. Um, if you're perhaps more conservative, you could be looking at something like 25%. Um, and this comes from this issue that even, even under a more generous budget, we've only got sort of 15 short haul flights left out to 2050 per person or 4.5 long haul flights over the same period. That's less than one per year. And I know I've got a lot of friends who um, are definitely taking more than one per year. Um, 
but what we also realized is that the frequent flyer levy is not going to be the only part of this package we're going to need a com comprehensive package of of uh, policies to deal with aviation's carbon footprint and this is just one contributor which particularly targets that fairness issue others could be things like caps at airports or mandates on on the sector to I mean, make use of certain fuels or certain technologies and, and all the rest of it that you'll be very familiar with so the precise design of the model in this case in our test case was that we would not charge any uh, taxes on uh, on a transfer flight so what we're dealing with here is a journey really more than a flight you know if you're flying you know from london to Schiphol airport in, in the netherlands and then onwards from somewhere out somewhere outside europe for example you wouldn't pay two charges for those two flights you'd just pay one i think that's as i understand it that's already how air passenger duty in the uk actually works so that's the standard pr principle but we do argue that from from the start from a start point that uh, flights to non-EU destinations would need to be charged a double levy. And that's because, of course, it's only on the departing flight that you would get the charge. On the way back, you'd be subject to the tax regime of the country that you've departed from outside of Europe, and you wouldn't be in, covered by the frequent flyer levy. Now, that wouldn't actually need to be like that if those other countries had what we considered to be a, also had their own fair tax policies on aviation. So what, what we're really talking about here is what's called a carbon border adjustment mechanism, which the European Union has recently implemented, which is to essentially say that when uh, something with a carbon footprint crosses the border, we will make an adjustment based on whether we think the foreign nation that it's come from has adequately taxed or dealt with the carbon emissions of that thing. If they have, then you don't need to make that adjustment. If they haven't, then you need to charge more. Um, we also modeled a scenario with a distance surcharge. The reason we've done that is because currently, as you'll be aware, aviation doesn't pay anything like a, a proper uh, fuel duty or kerosene tax or even carbon tax to most destinations. So there's nothing in the current system that adequately deals with uh, distance across Europe. There are some nations like the UK that have a bit of a distance uh, charge on their departure taxes, but it's not. Uh, many countries don't even have any departure tax at all, and it's not really properly tied to distance or carbon responsibility. So we want to be in a world where there's a proper fuel tax of some sort. Um, but in the absence of that, we modeled a distance-based surcharge as part of our package. Um, we debated a bit about how to treat foreign residents traveling into Europe with this tax mechanism, given that it is a sort of regionally specific measure. The key thing to say is, of course, that um, within Europe, the vast majority of flights are being taken by European residents, both within Europe from intra-European destinations and also departing Europe because you know we are higher income we are you know flying much more than other countries are so there's a small subset who are coming into europe from other nations and you could try to bring those individuals also into the frequent flyer levy program you could track their their movements and, and charge them very a varied rate based on how many times they came into europe but probably it just wouldn't really function very well so it'd be better off just with a, a flat departure tax on those those res residents um, that would ensure that they were still paying their fair share, but just in a different form. Um, so specifically on the frequent flyer levy, that as we modelled it, but as I said, it's not the sort of the only way it could be done. Um, we set up a, a design where the first return flight, or the first two single flights you took, or journeys you took, um, were essentially free from any tax charge. Um, other than potentially a distance-based adjustment, a, dis a distance-based charge. So, so a short short haul uh, flight would experience no tax at all, and then medium haul would just get a distance charge. Um, and then on your sort of second return flight, i.e. your single flights three and four, you'd pay 50 euros per flight. And then on single flights five and six or return flight number three, you'd pay 100 euros and so on, rising upwards from there. And we modeled this so that it would replace existing ticket taxes so in places like Germany, the Netherlands, the UK, where you might pay anything from sort of 10 to 50 to 100 pounds in a departure tax, that would be replaced by this. And uh, governments uh, implementing this would obviously sort of make back the lost revenue from that, from this new policy. Um, we also proposed that there would be an additional surcharge placed on um, sort of comfort class flights, flights in premium business or first class. We put this at 100 euros. I actually, in hindsight, think it should have been higher than that because I don't think that's a big enough adjustment, particularly when you're talking about business and first class flights. But uh, in the model, there were a very tiny number of the actual passengers in those higher classes. So 
um, it won't have had a significant impact on, on the design of the levin. Um, the only final thing to say is what we didn't do is we haven't placed or assumed any additional charges are placed on airlines for their non-carbon based emissions that also damage the climate. Um, there's an argument that those should be controlled in some way or potentially even taxed, um, but we didn't um, didn't do that in this piece of work. So the headline results across Europe, if you were to implement this in 2028, with what I recognize are relatively aggressive pricing levels, I would say, and hence in, in a sort of real world scenario, they might not be ramped up as aggressively as this, um, depending on, on your views. But if you were hypothetically to put it in place in 2028, you'd get a 21% reduction in aviation emissions. And of course, because most people uh, don't fly or only take one flight per year, they wouldn't be seeing any additional cost from that. The majority of people wouldn't see an additional cost from that 21% saving in emissions. Obviously that saving in emissions is, is linked to a reduction in passenger numbers in this scenario of around 26% in this case, um, and brings with it a very significant rise in tax revenues across Europe. So from current ticket taxes each year, Europe brings in something like 10 to 11 billion euros under this quite a punchy design of a levy. Uh, you raise seven, so around 74 billion euros in, in, that, in that year, um, which is pretty chunky increase in revenue. And you can look at that on a sort of country by country basis across Western Europe. Um, you can see on the very far right hand side, the kind of money that the, these different economies could raise from this levy. You know, looking at nine billion in the UK, three in the Netherlands, eight in Germany, and so on, um, and in each of those countries, varying levels of reduction in emissions and reduction in um, passenger journeys. Um, you will note there that uh, the Netherlands sees a smaller reduction in passenger journeys and emissions. That's because, as I understand it, because the Netherlands um, has a much larger share of the transfer passenger market, which, of course, as we said, doesn't uh, doesn't get taxed in the model on your transfer flight. So um, their demand doesn't reduce as much as other European nations do. Um, otherwise, it's a fairly sort of similar pattern based on at least these Western European nations. And of course, the key point is about the fairness of this. So as I say, around 54% around of these, the reduction in flying and hence the emissions savings comes from just 4.5% of the Western European population, the most frequent flyers. And 72% don't pay any frequent flying charges. And that can be split also by income. So looking on the right hand side of the figure for households on under 20,000 pounds or euros of household income, only 15% of people are affected by this, uh, pay any sort of additional frequent flying levy compared with 63% amongst households with higher incomes at over 100,000 euros or pounds per year. So from a fairness perspective, we think there's a pretty strong narrative there. And actually that 15% amongst low income households might even be a slight um, uh, a, a bit of a trick of the data because this is household income and there is actually a group of households out there who are on very low income but have very high wealth um, and because you know you might ask yourself well why are households with only 20,000 or less of income flying so frequently um, at all and of course one argument is some of them will fly for business um, but actually there's also this group of households who have very low income but high wealth and therefore are able to to fly frequently as a result of that um, so that's the kind of overview of the, the policy as we designed it. Then, you know, as I said, we've been working on this for a long time in the UK. And one of the key pushbacks that we've always had to the policy, even though it's widely popular sort of with the public in polling, it's popular with a decent number of politicians as well. But the challenge we always get is, oh, it's, it's too complicated. It's too technically difficult to implement. You couldn't do it. Now, I think there's, there's some legitimate concerns. But there's also some people who are saying that just because they don't actually like the policy and they want a way of getting rid of it. Um, and, and, and hence, this is just a convenient way of doing that. So we wanted to dive into a bit more detail on what it would take to actually do to deliver the policy. Um, so our legal assessment suggested that I think overall, is it legally feasible to do it? Yes, it is. It can be done. It's not an impossibility. There are some hurdles that you would have to overcome to do it. And the two perhaps most important are the issue of proportionality and unanimity. And I'll come back to those in, in a second. But from the basis of a sort of, um, does the EU, for example, have a mandate to take action on this? We think it has a very strong mandate for two reasons. One, because it has a mandate to work on environmental taxes, 
um, and to harmonize environmental taxes and deliver them across Europe. Um, and we think that the FFL could qualify as an environmental tax, albeit perhaps not in the more tra in the traditional sense of it, but that would still be a key objective of it. Um, the second point is that the EU has a mandate to um, do what they, they call ensuring a level playing field or harmonizing taxes across Europe. So that is to say, um, particularly in sectors where there's a very international dimension to them, ensuring that there's a consistent tax policies between nations makes it much easier for um, businesses to have certainty for um, you know loopholes not to be exploited and things. And I, I think even there's an argument right now today that it's very strange that some nations have uh, ticket departure taxes and some don't across Europe. Um, when there is obviously such freedom of movement across borders, the ability in some countries just to cross a border and take your flight from an airport in a neighbouring nation and things like that. Less of a case, of course, in, in the UK where it's harder to do. And as a result, you could argue actually be much easier to implement, implement a frequent flying levy because it's much harder to just jump over the border onto into another airport. Um, so a little more detail on those, those points. So unanimity, the, the challenge there, of course, is that tax measures in the EU require unanimous agreement from all European nations. And that is just hard for any policy, never mind a frequent flying levy, it's for any policy, it's difficult to get that um, agreement. And the, as I understand it, the European Emissions Trading Scheme, which currently does put a sort of price on European um, carbon emissions from flying and from other sectors, uh, was passed or was delivered because it wasn't a tax per se, it was a trading scheme, although it actually functions in many ways similar to a tax. They sort of got around the legislation on that, that's my understanding. Um, so if you weren't able to find a similar fudge for this policy, that, that could be a stumbling block. But equally, the analysis suggested that it wouldn't be that difficult for a subgroup of European nations who were wanted to be progressive and move forward to be able to deliver the levy um, collectively. Um, and there are precedents for that that we'll come back to. Then you've got the data privacy issues. So you, we always get this pushback when we talk about the policy. People say, oh, what about, you know, you know, it, it's too much of an invasion into people's privacy to track their flight movements. Now, of course, the, the first thing to say on that is they're already being tracked in a huge number of different ways, where, whether that be for security purposes, passport numbers being tracked for migration reasons, or, um, you know, frequent flyer programs that, you know, airlines and these sort of coalitions of airlines use to, to, to sort of track behavior of their passengers and offer rewards and incentives as a result. It's, it's commonplace, but nonetheless, people raise these concerns and we would obviously need to deliver a system that had protections to ensure that people's data was private. Um, in terms of how you might identify individuals, you would probably need a system that would deal with the fact that European residents can fly either on their passport or on their identity card when they're traveling within Europe. Um, and as a result, you know, you, we would probably need to create a single passenger identifier number. Um, there's precedent for that in the USA. They already have a known traveler number, uh, which the majority of, you, of, of you, US citizens now have, which helps to speed up security processes. Um, other examples of sort of a single number being assigned to, to an individual passenger around the world as well. And that would be used to sort of keep track of an individual's flights. Not a lot of data would actually need to be stored. It's basically just how many flights you took in the last 12 months. And that's it, really. Um, but it would be important to have a system that could ensure that, that passengers had price transparency about what they were purchasing when they went to buy a, a flight ticket. So, for example, uh, when you go into your search engine, Skyscanner or whatever, uh, currently you put you know, your dates of travel, your destinations, uh, how many people are traveling. Um, I, we can envisage a world where there's a, one additional box which says how many times have you flown in the last 12 months and you put in your number, you can say twice, for example. Um, and then it gives you a quote based on how many times you said you've flown. So it adjusts your tax paid based on what they what the system knows you would likely owe as a result of that. That's the sort of price checking component to it. Then when, when you actually move through to purchase the ticket, then obviously the system would need to be formalized um, the database would be contacted and the correct information for how many times the individual would flown would be um, extracted and, and put onto the, 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 the ticket price. We think it can work um, if there's the, the political will, I suppose. Just on that, though, I think the, the other thing that the legal advice did flag, I'll put it up here, is that if you were worried about the complexity of doing this or you wanted a quick, quicker, faster way of taxing frequent flyers, the other way to do it is to put the tax not on the point of sale, but to put it on 
an individual's tax return at the end of the year. Um, in many European nations, every individual in the country, every worker completes a tax return every year. So you, you wouldn't have a, even have a problem with that. In the UK, not everybody does. In the UK, anyone who earns over 150,000 does and anyone who's self-employed does. Um, if, you, for example, you were to put a charge just on people who flew more than six times per year, um, then the chances are that most of those people are, are people who earn over £150,000 a year anyway. And in fact, the data suggests that they are. Um, so they're already doing a tax return. But for those who don't earn or aren't currently paying on their tax return, uh, completing a tax return, um, maybe the additional bureaucracy of having to do one if you went over a certain number of flights is actually useful because it becomes part of the disincentive to... Uh, you know, to create excessive amounts of uh, flying emissions. But that's just a, a side reflection on what the legal advice was saying. Um, just to highlight before I finish and we move on to questions, there were a few precedents for, for some of these types of things. Um, in 2005, a group of countries, um, including European and non-European nations, got together and implemented what was called at the time a solidarity tax. Um, that ultimately became what is now the French government's departure tax on tickets but at the time was done as a collective of nations and was used to fund um, international development initiatives, proving that air departure taxes can be done at, as a collective amongst a group of willing nations. I mentioned already the carbon border adjustment mechanism that the EU has already done, was a policy that was thought to be impossibly complicated for, for a long time, and now it's done, um, and is used to essentially adjust um, the, the carbon tax paid at the border for whether or not another the, the foreign nation has adequately taxed that product. If that can be done, I don't see any reason that a frequent flyer levy couldn't also be done. Um, as I said, many uh, residents across the US already have a traveler number. And a final point about this in terms of what the EU has already done looking into aviation taxes, you know, we know that they've been debating endlessly various potential ideas, including a kerosene tax, and so far have not actually delivered anything. but have stated their intent to at various points. And as part of that process, they have done some high level economic impact assessments on aviation taxes. And those assessments broadly, I'm summarizing, but broadly suggested that at the very high level, when we're talking about things like you know, GDP and macroeconomic indicators, taxing air, air travel um, a bit more aggressively wouldn't actually have any particularly serious negative downsides. Indeed, it has some positive upsides. At the, at the high level, and that's not to try and downplay some of the impacts at local local areas. Um, and that's where the issue of use of revenues comes in. So you're going to generate a lot of money from this, potentially 64 odd billion euros a year across Europe with this design. Uh, that's actually equivalent to almost 30% of the entire EU budget. And of course, we could use that to finance the just transition in Europe, to support workers inside the aviation industry, inside um, areas, by, for example, dependent on tourism currently um, to, um, you know, obviously deliver um, alternative, alternative economies, more sustainable economies uh, in infrastructure for other industries like rail, other, other transport options and, and, and the, whole, the whole works, upskilling um, for, for green industries and the like, but focus at the workers. What we don't necessarily think is that we should be using these revenues just to pay airlines to then cover their costs of, of decarbonizing. We think that they should shoulder the, those costs themselves. Um, and finally, we think that a, a component of the revenue base should be used to compensate um, residents of, um, uh, of the global south and, and other more um, vulnerable nations that have been affected worst by the climate crisis. Um, and the only final thing to, to flag is at NEF a few years ago, three years ago now, I think, um, we worked with the collective aviation unions um, on um, some asks at the time, obviously it was middle of COVID, um, jobs were really being affected in the aviation industry. And we wanted to work with, the, with them to talk about how, what would a fair package to support workers in the sector look like? Um, I'm sure there are plenty of people on the call with more knowledge than I have on this and, and, and opinions on this, but the, the sort of collective ask that we arrived at back then um, with, with the TUC and other U, uh, UK unions was what you see in front of you here, which included um, you know, crisis support planning, um, collective um, design of, of, of a sector-wide strategy which brought together unions, businesses and government, um, and you know, union neg negotiated limits on any redundancies that were required, um, uh, job retention schemes to ensure that, um, you know, in, at the time it was sort of thinking 
about things like furlough and the way that jobs could be protected while workers could reskill or upskill um, for, for green economy jobs and, and, and other opportunities, um, as well as talking about how the government should be raising tax from the sector to support these, to cover these costs. Um, and I just, yeah, I just wanted to flag that to, because I'd be interested to hear other opinions on, on, on how that money could be spent to, to support workers. And um, yeah, I think I'll leave it there and we can open up for discussion. Oh, that's brilliant. Thank you so much for that very insightful um, presentation, Alex. And uh, yeah, if you are watching this recording online, and you're new to our group, then you know we are a group of aviation workers, both inside and out, and we'd love uh, to hear from you if you'd like to get in touch.